Okay, so some of you may be thinking after watching chapter one, wow, that was uh, that was kind of deep. That was a little complicated. I I didn't realize the letter to Hebrews was like that. It it is. I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, there are chapters in the letter to Hebrews that get um, are easier to understand as we dive later, like into Hebrews 11, 12, and thirteen. But then there are some that are complicated. Um, there's some deep theological conversations that take place and that continues in chapter two and we're going to read it together and I'm going to do my absolute best to be able to share it with you in a way that is simple and as easy to understand as possible. Um, And if any part of it confuses you, that's okay. Um, There's times when I read my scripture, I've learned that some things I just, I don't totally comprehend And what I've learned is later in life, God will reveal it to me in a new way. And sometimes I just wasn't ready to receive it at that point in time in my life. And that's totally cool. Sometimes as God takes us from glory to glory, he shows us different things at different point in times. Just like we learned in chapter one, God spoke at various times in various ways. In my own life, sometimes God speaks in various times in various ways personally to me as he's committed to helping me grow, being faithful to complete the work that he started. Chapter two, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. Okay, we need to be careful to pay attention to what we've learned from the Lord so that we don't find ourselves drifting away. You've never seen anyone that drifts into success. You have to intentionally work to be successful. I've never seen anyone who's drifted into being in shape. You have to intentionally work out and be intentional to do what it takes to get where you want to be. He says, let's not drift. For since the message spoken through the angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? Okay. I believe in verse 2. He's referring to the law. How every violation and disobedient received a just punishment. The Levitical law, all in the Old Testament, there was consequences for every action. He says, but now, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, I believe he's speaking, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. I believe he's speaking about the Gospels and and really the the book of Acts, how God did these miracles, um, and there were these signs in the life of Jesus, but also the the, uh, the disciples and the apostles, and as they began to plant the church, God was confirming what he had already spoken. Verse 5. Your Bible header may say Jesus made fully human. Verse 5 says, It is not to angels that he was subject, subjected the world to come about which we are speaking, but there's a place where someone has testified. Now, he begins to quote 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man that you care for him. Who is man that you are mindful of him? Or or the son of man that you would care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels, but you crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. This is uh, a combination of many different scriptures. It's got Psalms in it. It's got Second Samuel. It's got First Chronicles. He's basically saying, who is man that you think of him? Who, who is man that you care about him, that you care for him like a child, even though he's, he's been made a little lower than the angels, even though he's here on earth and they're in heaven? You crown them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. You gave us, um, you told us in the garden to, to take dominion over the earth. Verse 8 says, in putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them, but we do see Jesus. I believe what he's trying to communicate is, you know, we don't see, and we possibly don't understand everything that's going on around us or everything that's taking place from a spiritual perspective. We don't totally understand. Uh, I think the scripture says in one place, we see through a glass dimly. We, we just don't have this full comprehension, but one day when we're before God, God will reveal things to us in an incredible way. But he says, we do see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while. Okay, Jesus was in heaven and he put on flesh and he came down 
and came in the likeness of man, the book of Philippians tells us. And he served. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. But now he's crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Jesus came down to earth and he suffered for us and gave his life for us. And now he's seated in heaven, verse 10, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory. It was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Whew, okay, we're going to go through that really slow. Verse 10, it's a significant scripture, and I want to break it down for you. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists. Okay, everything exists because of God, and everything exists for God. And Jesus brought many of God's sons and daughters back to God at the cross. And he was made the pioneer of our salvation, perfect through what he suffered. Hebrews 5 will later tell us, I believe, that he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. As he was obedient to God on the cross and he suffered in our place, he became the access point. He became the door to have access to the Father because he took our punishment in our place. He's the pioneer. Another part of the scripture, it's in Hebrews 12, will say, looking into Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. An author or a pioneer, they're synonymous words. Someone who goes before. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. As it is written, and he begins to quote the scripture again, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. That's Psalm 22. And again, I will put my trust in him, it says in Isaiah 8. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. That's also in Isaiah 8. He says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. Okay, here we go. Now we're diving into something that's a little more easier to digest and process. Basically, what Paul is communicating is he says, look, we have flesh and blood. Jesus came and he put on flesh and he was like us. He shared in our humanity so that when he died for us on the cross, he would break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. When Adam and Eve fell, there, there was a transfer of authority in the earth. And the devil was often ruled to as the ruler of the spirit of the air. That, that he would, when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he would offer him different things because he had authority on the earth. But when Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave, when Jesus defeated the devil, all authority was given to Jesus. He defeated the devil. Verse 15, and freed those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. We've been set free. We don't have to be fearful of death. I don't have to be afraid of dying. I know that when I die, I go to heaven. I know that when I die, I have a promise of something better. I don't have to be worried. You don't have to be worried. We actually, I know this sounds weird, we should get a little bit excited when we think about dying. Because when I die, that means that I'm gonna be with Christ. And if and if I ever catch myself being afraid or something health-wise, I'm like, hold on, wait a second, get behind me, Satan. That thought's not from the Lord. Paul said to live is um, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He says, look, when, when we die and when it's God's timing for us to go pass away, we'll go be with Christ, and it'll be the best thing that ever happened to us. That should excite you. That should excite me. Verse 16, for surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Okay, we're going to close with this. And then we're going to dive into the other chapters, because it's going to start talking about the high priest and how Jesus was fit to be the high priest. And I'll explain all that to you in the later chapters. But basically, what is being communicated to us is that Jesus became like us so that he could help us. And as Jesus became like us, he was tempted and he suffered in every way. And he understands what you're walking through. He understands what I'm walking through. So then when we bring our cares to him, because he cares for you, he knows what's going on in your life. He understands, he empathizes, he sympathizes. God is so emotionally in 
tune and in touch. And we don't need to look at God as too distant for us. It's this weird balance. He's, he's both my Lord, yet he calls me friend. He's, he's God and he's so far above me, yet he chooses to come do life beside me and his Holy Spirit dwells within me. It's such an incredible picture of who God is. And yes, sometimes when we dive into the theology, it can get a little complicated. But basically what the writer was doing, the Apostle Paul was doing, was he was communicating to the Jewish people at their level. And I think that that's so cool that God speaks to us in ways that he, he comes and relates to us. The scripture says, and I'll close with this, I feel led to share this with you. He who wants friends must show himself friendly. God is always showing himself friendly by meeting us where we're at. Be intentional, meet people where they're at, because I believe that there are friends that God has called you to make that are everlasting, because God's called us to reach people and to share the love of his son. Be blessed today.